My name is Phil Mayle, uh, as I've just been introduced. I'm, I'm the chairman of Jersey Telecom, um, but I also do a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, I've got a, I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, I spent 10 years in the media industry, uh, and then uh, when I left the media industry, started up the world's first internet service provider, uh, fighting telecoms companies and trying to make them do things they didn't really want to do, and then ended up running one, uh, Cable Wireless, for a few years. Um, so. I was sent an exam question uh, by Courtney, which was, what data could Jersey Telecom provide to a digital twin? Um, so I thought I'd try and answer the exam question. Telecoms is really hard. <laughs> 20 years in the industry, telecoms is really, really hard. It is way harder than you think it is. Um, most of this stuff, most of the protocols, most of the platforms, most of the systems were invented 150 years ago. The internet is just a little blip on telecom's history. Most of this stuff is so old you wouldn't believe it. Um, we have systems upon systems upon systems. We have physical infrastructures the size of which would make your mind boggle. So I used to run Cable Wireless. We operated in 172 different countries. We had literally billions of devices out on the end of our networks. And they had been there. I mean, I walked in, the first day I walked into my office in Cape and Wireless, there was a corridor with previous directors of Cape and Wireless on the wall with pictures of people with tigers slung over their shoulder and pith helmets on. This is the company that took telecoms to India. We have literally billions of devices out there. Um, Jersey Telecom is no different. Um, you can imagine all the routers and all the phones and all the phone lines and the digging up the streets, and I'm sure you've all been very familiar with all that sort of stuff. But the layers of the systems that we've got come from different eras. So if you think about voice, um, and I'll just take you to a little bit of a, 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 a sort of a deep dive into some voice stuff. Um, when you pick up the phone and you lift up the handset and you press the one, that makes a little dial. It makes a little tone or it makes a little click, click, click. The clicks still work. Somewhere deep in the bowels of the telephone network, a little bit of data gets collect, uh, created, called a CDR, that says, you have just pressed the number one. And it gets filed away inside the telephone exchange in your, uh, next to your house. Meanwhile, somebody else is pressing their buttons on their phones and making phone calls, and other little records are getting generated inside these switches in the telephone exchange. You then press the next button too, and another bit of data gets created, and it gets put in the local switch. And it's jumbled up with all the other bits of data. Eventually, the switch decides it's had enough of this, and it's got enough data, and it's going to send it upstream. And it sends it up to a mediation platform. So we have this whole system, complete systems architecture, for sifting through these little key presses and dials and records that tell you when you picked and put down the, the handset. The mediation system tries to pick at all these pieces of data and trying to put a story together that says, you, Phil, made a phone call from your house to India at this time for this duration. And it passes that information up to the billing system, which then tries to apply tariffs, look at wholesale prices, look at retail prices, tries and add it to your bill, then tries to apply discounts and various things that it needs to do. Imagine that going on in real time across 172 different countries. We had 14 billing systems at Cable and Wireless, 100 plus transit switches, so just big infrastructure switches that were designed to route calls between other networks, let alone just control the people on the end of the networks. And all of this stuff is sitting there humming away reliably, working across jurisdictions, connected to telecoms companies all over the world, and happily been doing that for about 100 years. Then along comes mobile. And it's got a whole different world and a whole different set of standards and systems and is invented in a different way by a different bunch of people with wireless and it has to have its own control planes and its own different ways of billing and its own different ways of doing calls. And then comes the internet and a whole other set of networks and complicated systems get put in. And it even gets to the point where we try and make some of the routers in our internet infrastructure look like voice systems because it's easier to build internet 
by just plugging it through the old voice billing systems. So the layers upon layers upon layers of technology you've got here just make for this mass of data. If you want to think about it this way, this is a huge IoT platform that already covers the globe and has been working for 100 plus years. However, when it comes to the data we collect and the data we have, you can broadly classify it into three chunks. We collect a whole pile of information about how our network works. Every little one of those phones, those routers, those devices, those bits of optical gear, the bits of copper network systems, everything is spewing back gigabytes of data in real time, all the time. And we feed those into our management systems, our operation systems to make sure everything's working okay. We feed them into the systems that allow calls to be routed, for internet traffic to go in certain directions and to make sure that bits are connected and up. And again, there are roomfuls of kit that do that, roomfuls. On top of all of that, obviously, we collect usage data. We collect the records that, that tell us who made a call, what they did, where they were, and when the networks and services were used. The one key thing we don't record is why. We specifically don't call why. But all of that data has to be fed into billing systems and accounted for and settled and discounts applied and all the other bits and pieces. There's a whole world of data just around how people use the, the, the devices and networks and services we provide. And then like any other business, any other business, telecoms companies have lots of customer data. Every time you call the support centre, every time you buy something from us, every time you walk into a shop, every time you transact with us financially, every time that we ourselves go out to the market and try and gather information about market trends and what people are buying and all those good bits and respond to our social media feeds and all those kind of things. And broadly, they are the three categories of data that we have. And we have data by the bucket load in every single one of those categories. We go back to that point about the, the different generations of technology that we have. All of that data is organized in layers. And this layering of the data is much more complicated than those of you familiar with the internet. We have different physical systems that have different sections of the data. So the systems that connect a voice call between two different switches are physically different systems from the ones that sit behind it and tell it where to go. And they're in different places, in different formats, in different systems. They don't ever connect in any way, shape, or form. It looks remarkably like the post office. If you think about a parcel that's being sent, It'll have an address label on the front of it. The post office gets to see the address label, but they don't get to see what's in the parcel. Now, that's, that's not an accident. Most of the telecoms infrastructures and protocols and standards were developed by people who ran postal systems. And that's why those systems work this way. But there's another reason why we layer data and why we look after data and why we have to be very careful about the sort of data that we use. We as a company have all the standard data protection legislation things that we have to think about that any business has to think about. GDPR, customer data, whether or not we use it for the right purpose, whether we've got account information in the right place, whether it's secure. But we also have two other things. We have telecom specific regulation. There's a whole world of, of regulatory standards and compliance that we have to go through to make sure that we're protecting people's privacy, looking after the data correctly. And this predates any of the GDPR or uh, any, any of the sort of information protection data that, uh, uh, legislation that you know about. Telecom specific le legislation has been going on for years. It is global and we have obligations not just within our own domain, but also to the carriers that we talk to. There's also a security requirement on the data we provide. You know, we're a business, we have confidential information. Some of the stuff that we do would be valuable to competitors. We have to think about that, the same as any other business does. But we also have to connect the heart of our business, so all our switches and routers and networks and protocols and services, to everybody else on the planet. And that's where you start to get some really interesting stuff. Because that's where we start to get, delve into the world of cybercrime and fraud and all the other bits and pieces we have to worry about. When we're connecting customer switchboards to our network, we have to make sure 
that we can't, nobody from Australia can break into a local switchboard and make phone calls out from your switchboard. There's a whole world of stuff that we have to think about uh, from a security perspective. And of course, we have contracts with customers. We have legal obligations with our customers to make sure that they've got certain rights, that we're using their data in a certain way, um, and that we are taking the data from them to, to bill them or to uh, provide them with a service. And again, that predates a lot of the GDPR stuff. This is, this is enshrined in telecoms regulation. And if you go and read those big fat documents you get from various telecoms companies about what, what your mobile contract is, you'll find clauses in there about how you can and can't use your data. Now, you can choose to waive some of that when you go onto Facebook and you decide that you want to give you know, various bits of data to them. That's absolutely fine. That's your data to give it. But from a telecoms perspective, these contracts are enshrined, they're written when you take out the service and we don't often change them. There's another layer of problems as well when it comes to getting hold of the data inside a telecoms company. Our business model, telecoms business models, are about building a great big infrastructure. We stick a lot of capital in the ground, we dig up streets, we put in cables, we lay them on the bottom of oceans. And the way we make money is we contend those. We try and put a lot of phone calls over them, we try and keep them as busy and as full as possible all the time. I thought it was interesting when you just heard about the cranes, where you heard about how they want to keep the cranes going all the time. Well, telecoms has been doing that for 150 years. You know, when we lay a subsea cable system across to, to the US, we want it full, because that's how we make money out of it. So the whole process flow, the whole, the whole workflow systems that are inside telcos have always been designed to maximize the utilization of the network. If you think about the old days when you used to get a, a, a phone line installed from, from let's say, BT, uh, a phone line in the wall, you know, it was the telco that told you when you had to be home. It was the telco that told you when the, when the socket would, would, would go. It was the telco who gave you a little connection that you had to go and buy a little jack socket that plugged in the, in the side of the router. Because the telecoms company needs to dictate that workflow in order to maximize the amount of traffic across its network. If we go sticking things into systems, probes, new processes, or changes into the middle of those flows, it is literally like drinking from a fire hose. It's like putting your finger in the middle of this thing and just watching data spew everywhere. Because the unintended consequences of slowing down some of those flows have ramifications later on. If we slow down and sample some data at the, um, in, the, in the call center, that data may not get to the engineer for in the right half hour, so he'll miss his slot, and then he doesn't do the right bit of work on the, on the network. So we, we, we have to think about the process flows that we have to, uh, to manage inside the business. It's also really complex. A lot of these, these things are buried deep in the bowels. We throw most of our data away. Well, the, the, the talk uh, just a second ago about these devices saying hello, hello, hello all the time. I mean, we have that too. We have lots of devices that sit there and say hello, hello, hello. That's actually valuable information in a lot of cases. Uh, and I'll talk about one in a bit, uh, a bit later. But we still throw a lot of our data away. Because just being able to focus on the right bits of data that come out of the infrastructure is quite a challenge. And then there's a third thing. You know, I've got a mobile phone. I don't particularly want people sniffing and looking at my data either, the same as you don't. And so we have a moral responsibility. We have to look after the data we have, we have to understand what it's used for, and we have to make sure that it's segregated and used accordingly. You know, most of the people in our business can't see most of the data. You only get to see the bits of data that you need to see. Now, when it comes to digital twins, I have to say the expression makes me smile somewhat. You know, we've been making use of digital twins for a long time. We used to call them test labs. You know, we, we build up big versions of our network. We model it. In the bad old days, we did it with bits of iron and bits of metal and soldering irons, and we would stress test and flood test calls going through switches. In the good old days, you know, with, with the internet stuff, we would still build up test networks and subframes and have racks and cables going between them and put flooding things on top of them and measure their performance. These days, as things are uh, moving more into software areas, we can model them, and we do. And we also run things like cold, warm, and hot analytics across them. 
We're constantly monitoring the network. We're constantly running models against it. We're constantly looking for things like deviations in traffic patterns to figure out whether people have been hacking or whether there's fraud or whether there's a, an emergency that we've got to deal with or whether we've got to separate bits of the network or things have fallen off a cliff. So it does make me smile a little bit when we hear about some of these digital twin stuffs because really this stuff has been going on for years. It really has been going on for years. However, when you look at some of the technologies and services that are currently in the pipeline, that's when it gets much more interesting. The technologies, I don't understand these, I apologize, but things like software-defined networks, where we are basically putting um, huge amounts of capacity around and then leaving it. And then we define all the network architecture and who connects to what and how the routers function in pure software. So essentially, we create a software network. We don't, we don't have any physical devices anymore. Cloud platforms. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the word cloud, but you know, we're talking about virtual servers, virtual routers, virtual data centers where you can say, I want you know, a new database over there, please. A virtual server gets created and we say we want three routers and we want to connect them this way on this kind of land to this print server. <coughs> very easy. All of these are defined in software on basic compute. So creating digital twins for these kind of applications becomes very, very possible. It's no longer a question of getting a soldering iron out and having a great big switch sat in the lab. And the talk earlier about edge compute, I mean, fog computing, which is where we start to move the processing towards the edge. I mean, that's something that we've done in telecoms for years. You know, the, the exchange that's been sat um, on the edge of, your, or edge of your street has a small but fully functional exchange system in there that will allow you to make a local call. So it doesn't go into the main network, it just goes into the local exchange and calls your next door neighbor. And that, that compute device, the telephone switch that is sat at the end of the street is doing exactly this. It's putting edge processing at the, at the, at the, at the site at the edge of the network. So when it comes to the sort of data that we have and that we have access to, we apply these four tests to it. So before we could release any data to anybody for anything, we have to apply to each of these tests. Is it legal to do so? Do we understand what the data is? Which regulation is covering it? Is it commercially viable? Is it worth collecting it for the benefit? Remember sticking the finger in the fire hose. Is it commercially sensitive, both competitively and for our customers, because they have competitors too? So if we released a whole bunch of data that said, you know, 58 people got off this ferry and went to this rental company and, and made a credit card transaction, would that be anti-competitive for the other rental company that was sat next door, as an example? Can we do it? Can we do it reliably, repeatedly, scalably? Because if we can't, then we've got an integrity problem. We can't trust the data that we're getting out, and that's no good for us, and it's no good for the person that's requesting it. And lastly, is it moral to do so? Is this the sort of data that people want to be uh, made available? You know, one of the examples that was thrown at me was, um, you know, you could tell how many people were walking on the beach. Well, that's great. I could tell you there were 200 people roughly logged into that general area off the mobile networks. So what if there's only one? What if there isn't 200? What if the little data model that's spewing out all the time in 24 hours says there's one person on the beach? And you can see who it is. Does that now become morally right that we do that? There are things we can do, though. We have a lot of relative operational data. So we can say, right, on Christmas Day, blah, 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 everybody started talking to their great aunt in, in London. Or everybody stopped watching television when the commercial break came on and they all went over and, and started using the internet. And we can snapshot that year on year. And we can say that actually this year, was, it was, the internet was used more on Christmas Day than it was last year, that kind of stuff. Donated data, so where people volunteer and say, actually, do you know what? You can take you know, my 58 phone bills that I've had over the last three years and you can aggregate them up and use them as some sort of data model. That, that would be great. Moments in time, events, things where you can orchestrate and get consent, events like this. 
You know, we could have all asked you when you came in the door, do you mind if we take your mobile phone numbers? Do we figure out whether we can send you a text message or not? Will you consent to using that data for voting purposes for your, for your vote system? So consent-based data. And then the last one, which is much more interesting, specifically collected data. This is where we deploy systems that are targeted to collect data, IoT platforms, sensors and applications that are done with a specific intent to create a set of data for a particular purpose. This, this is actually my um, 10 technology list. These are the 10 technologies that in the next 10 years are going to change the way that we use data. We as telecoms companies, and I'm not just talking about JT here, I'm talking about the other telecoms companies I'm involved in as well. The, these are all, all 10 of these, going to be deployable infrastructures and deployable architectures that generate vast amounts of data in the next 10 years. Artificial intelligence, drones, we're already doing a lot of trials with that sort of stuff. Smart cities and IoT. Blockchain, augmented reality. People smile when I always talk about that one, but I'm wearing an Apple Watch, this thing buzzes on my wrist when I get a message. That is an augmented reality service. 5G, a lot to talk about here. Security, cyber security, believe me, we haven't even seen the start of that world. Robotics, 3D printing. 3D printing is a really interesting technology for us, really interesting. The idea of getting spares, circuit boards to remote locations, things like that are starting to get really, really interesting. And full virtual reality. Just the bandwidth requirements, the usage, fascinating area for telcos. And all, of all the technologies we look at, these are the 10 which we think are going to be the ones that hit us the hardest. Now, one of the other things I do, um, as well as my JT hat on, is I sit on the board and have been on the board been on board for some time, of a company called the DCC, which is probably the biggest company you've never heard of. Um, DCC is the uh, data communications company, as you can see on the slide. Um, it's a £16 billion operation of 400 people operating out of London. Uh, and we are rolling out the UK government's IoT platform. Uh, application number one on that is smart meters. Uh, so we are literally, as of three weeks ago, starting to kick down doors and put in what's called SMETS 2, version 2, smart meters, into every home in the UK. Uh, 100 million devices are being deployed in the next four years. Uh, we have about 300 million install certificates already issued, 17,500 uh, trained engineers with install certificates ready, locked and loaded to go. And we've got to get to 30 million homes deploying 53 million meters by 2020. Huge, huge, huge program. Um, and one that I've been involved in from day one, when there were literally two of us. Uh, now, what's been really interesting about this, of the 16 billion that we're spending, six of it was on building a completely new fabric for IoT in the UK. We have rolled a completely new network, not based on any other telecoms network or infrastructure. £6 billion pounds in rolling a completely new IoT platform. Um, you have three in Jersey already, and have had them for about a year and a half. And over and above, gigabit. We have lower networks, we have 4G networks ready for IoT, and we have management capability. Some of that, 70 uh, percent of our business that is overseas, is JT deploying IoT sims around the world. We have about 2 million SIMs under management doing IoT things not on this island today, right now as I stand here. And with all of that, all the gigabit, all the IoT, and all the things and the, 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 the fantastic state that Jersey has got itself into in terms of all this infrastructure, the clock's still ticking. And it's conferences and gatherings like this with, with Tony and Digital Jersey that should stimulate some of the ideas that can use some of this plumbing that's been put in place on this island. Rather than asking the question about what data we should be getting from, from the telecoms network, I'd much rather be having a conversation about what applications we could load on top of this world-class infrastructure, because it genuinely is. 
And just to throw some thoughts at you, and be a little bit controversial because I like doing that. I, I, when, I, when I took this job here, uh, Graham took me, took me to a beach on the north side of the island. And he said, uh, this is the sunniest place in the UK, um, and it's always like this. And that was a picture I took from him. It's always like this, he said. Since then, in the last seven years, I think I've got two flights that haven't been fog-bound, I think. But you have an environment to die for and a standard of living to die for. Why aren't you doing environmental IoT? Why aren't you championing environmental IoT? You're about to spend half a billion quid on a hospital. Half a billion quid on a hospital. I don't know many places that are doing that. Um, I don't see any med tech. I don't see any remote doctor programs. I don't see, I see a health strategy, but I don't see it joined up. I don't see IoT for old age people at home, care in the community. I don't see doctors being trained. I don't see outreach programs. I don't see any of that. You're in Ireland. I fly in from the airport, because I don't live here, um, and I pass a Porsche garage, um, and I see, well, there's some stat. I saw there were four Bugatti Veyrons on the island, I think somebody had told me. I don't see many electric cars, and I don't understand why. You have a speed limit, and I don't think I could run a battery flat if I spent all day in it. So I don't get that. Um, and security. You have a finance industry. You have a reputation for trust. You have a reputation for um, uh, financial management. You have a reputation for looking after things and proper process. Why aren't you championing cybersecurity? Why aren't you the best place in the world to do your data processing offshore? Why aren't you doing that? And when it comes to this stuff, this AI stuff, because this stuff is coming at you like a train, 50% of jobs. 50% of jobs are going to be hit by this, globally, over the next 30 years. Where's the AI programs? Just a thought. Thank you. <laughs>